Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 5th to 11th of April 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Before jumping into this week's news updates, a special shout out to our good friends at GoTikonauts and at Spacewatch.global, and also a reminder to be on the lookout for the release of our Dongfang Hour Episode 8 long-form episode coming out tomorrow, that is April 12th, a discussion with the Secure World Foundation and Kalis Foundation on U.S. perceptions of Chinese commercial space. This week, we bring you an update on China's uh, potentially upcoming commercial launch site, uh, yet another round of funding from probably the ninth most well-funded commercial launch company in China. But first, Jean will bring us some updates on another Chinese tech giant getting involved in the space sector. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. Jean, take it away. So this week, we have seen signs hinting at TCL, China's uh, one of China's consumer electronics giant, investing into the space sector. And so we know this because earlier this week, they created a subsidiary called Moshing Semiconductors based in Guangzhou, and uh, that would likely focus on space industry integrated circuits. And um, this is because when we look up their um, scope of business in the uh, incorporation information in a Chinese uh, corporate database, we see things like um, GNSS enhancement systems, satellite remote sensing um, systems, integrated satellite applications technology. And this is alongside things like um, IC design and manufacturing. So that's the first a very suggestive point. And the other one is just the name of the company, right? Mo Xing uh, Semiconductor. Xing being the character, literally meaning star, but is used to designate um, satellites. So um, I think that's a, that's a very good sign that this is what the company will be uh, about. And so I think this, this new, news is big because we know that outside of China, a lot of non-space companies have um, gotten involved a lot into um, the space industry. And some of the easier examples that come to mind are, um, you know, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon all getting involved in the space industry at different different scales. And in China, the involvement of these non-space industries uh, have been much uh, much slower, I'd say, because the the space industry in China is just uh, much more regulated, and these regulations regarding commercial companies are much more um, much more muddy still. So um, space tech is not such a straightforward investment for uh, a Chinese investor as compared to other booming industries in China, such as um, the B2C uh, tech industry, right? Um, and so there's that. But having said that, there are also some early movers in China. Some um, probably more obvious examples are Argili, which we've mentioned multiple times on the Dongfang Hour, which is an automobile company, which has di diversified into manufacturing its own satellites and building its own Satnav and narrowband constellation. And there are others such as um, Xiaomi with uh, you know consumer tech background. We have um, Gri, for example, its home appliances and air conditioning, and we have another company uh, such as uh, Country Garden. They're a real estate company, and all these companies have at some point invested into uh, the space industry. And it's really fascinating to see the these companies, and especially sometimes they're very emblematic CEOs in China, such as Lei Jun, CEO of Xiaomi. Um, yeah, very visible person or, or Dong Mingzhu uh, of Gri, also a uh, very powerful businesswoman in, in China. Uh, these people are starting to interconnect the non-space industries and the space industries. And Li Dongsheng, apparently the CEO of TCL, very well could be one of them in the future based on the news that we're getting today. And I think that the announcement of TCL creating the subsidiary got rather little attention in the West. Um, but it's definitely uh, generated some excited articles in Chinese. And so there's not only this one uh, that was titled uh, Li Dongsheng from televisions to semiconductors and now commercial space, question mark, published on the 3S News platform. And so really Li Dongsheng has announced multiple times in the past. We've seen this at the two sessions, for example, in 2018, where he said that he was planning to move TCL from its current you know, core business, which is home appliances. You probably know TCL as a television manufacturer to industries such as artificial intelligence, such as semiconductors, such as smart manufacturing, and apparently based on what we see this week, 
um, space tech could very well be, uh, you know, one of these uh, diversifications. And uh, this would be big, I think, for, um, you know, Chinese space, Chinese commercial space, because TCL is a big company. And for, I think from a symbolic point of view, having another of these uh, non-space, very big um, tech companies invest into the space industry, that's a good sign for um, for the future of Chinese commercial space. For sure. And just to give a, a little bit more context on, on TCL. So um, first of all, very large company, about 10 billion US dollars in 2019 revenues, market capitalization of about 20 to 24 billion US dollars, uh, about 35,000 employees. So really a, a very large company. And uh, <clears throat> speaking for as, as someone who has uh, spent several very formative years in Guangdong province, um, you know, this company has a a place quite close to my heart in the sense that they are headquartered in uh, in Huizhou, which is a, you could call it, I suppose, a third tier city or possible, well, yeah, it should be a third tier city, uh, just to the to the northeast of, of Shenzhen. So um, definitely it, it's uh, a win for the Guangdong space sector to see a company like TCL coming into um, to the industry. So just a couple of points worth noting. Um, definitely agree, Jean, with your point about um, regulations in China being a little bit more muddy than than in the uh, in the West as it relates to space in particular. And I, I also feel there's, uh, and we mentioned before, this different perception about regulations, which is to say in the West, um, unless, you know, if something is, um, if something is not yet considered to be illegal, then you are allowed to do that thing, basically. And in China, it seems that until something is said to be legal, um, you, you, you cannot do that thing. And so basically, you have a situation where um, a lot of companies, they tend to be a lot more conservative about what they try to do. Because again, it, it's sort of they, they wait until the government says that this industry is open for private investment or, or for sort of generally private involvement. Um, so it, it may be a, a hindrance for, for tech companies in general, um, in the sense that it just makes any major moves into sort of emerging industries politically fraught. Um, so the second point I'd like to bring up is that um, it, it's interesting to, to see a company like TCL moving into a part of the space industry uh, that is first a lot less flashy than, say, rockets, for example, um, but also second, a lot closer to the company's core competencies. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the commercial space sector in general, it is probably on a sort of long term upward growth trend. And that's going to require a lot of supporting industries and a lot of upstream suppliers and a lot of subsystems level companies that are doing, you know, generally space related things, but again, that are not building something as sexy as rockets. And indeed, uh, you know, space integrated circuits and this type of thing, it is definitely not as sexy as rockets, uh, but they are necessary. And TCL is a company that knows how to do these these types of things in general. So, um, I would say, you know, <clears throat> good on TCL apparently for trying to stick with um, a technology that they're relatively more familiar with and trying to apply it to the space sector in a way that is um, that is needed. Um, so just a couple of other small points about TCL. It's interesting to see another company setting up in Guangzhou with space efforts. And we, we see quite the space cluster developing in Guangzhou. So as we mentioned all the way back on the Dongfang Hour News episode uh, three, which was back in October, uh, Guangzhou has attracted the Chinese Academy of Sciences and, and their rocket company, Cast Space, so uh, it was uh, Zhongke Yuhang, um, where they built the um, the sort of Cast Science City, which is in Nansha district of Guangzhou. And so we have a um, a, a sort of a, a space cluster there. And we've uh, more recently seen Gili uh, move their headquarters of their space operations also to Nansha in uh, in Guangzhou. And so I, I I don't recall, and I, I may, John, maybe you've seen what, whether TCL's space operations in, in Guangzhou are going to be uh, based in, in Nansha, but but either way, I think it's interesting to see another company setting up some space-related operations in the city of Guangzhou. Um, and we can put up a map here on, on the video version, but but I would also point out that TCL, um, their headquarters in, in Huizhou is is relatively close to, to to Guangzhou. It'd be about you know less than or about two hour drive, let's say, from from Guangzhou. Um, and uh, just a final point, I suppose, on, on the Guangdong space sector in, in general. Um, interesting that we, we saw earlier this week uh, Zero Gravity Labs, um, which is a small satellite manufacturer. They were recruiting for a number of jobs in uh, in Shaoguan, which is an even smaller city up in uh, in the northern part of Guangdong. So really, uh, again, this TCL announcement being indicative of, I think, Guangdong province in general really 
playing catch up in space and, and doing a reasonably good job of attracting uh, more companies. Um, so just a couple of, of last last points on TCL that are not necessarily related to space, but it's just more kind of fun trivia. Um, so apparently, for, for those who are not familiar with, with California and with Hollywood, there there's the, the Groman's Chinese Theater, and I may have mispronounced uh, Groman. So to the Groman family, I, I apologize if you are listening to this. But but um, there's this very famous Chinese style theater in uh, in Hollywood right on Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, you know, there's a, a sort of right on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And there's a uh, there's a Simpsons episode that parodies this. And uh, apparently TCL bought the naming rights to this theater back in 2013 for about $5 million. So it is now the the TCL Chinese Theater on uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, so that's the first kind of random bit of trivia. And uh, I distinctly recall my last time being in, in Los Angeles at the Groban's Chinese, the TCL Chinese Theater in, uh, in September of 2011. I had a couple of adult beverages. I was admiring the theater, and then I took a photo immediately afterwards with someone dressed as Chewbacca and someone dressed as Han Solo because it was in Hollywood. You'll you'll have to put that photo up on the podcast. I I was looking for it earlier today, yeah, and I will see if I can find it. But um, my then the f- final final point about um, Chinese tech companies getting into space. I would mention, and we may have discussed this before, that the the first big Chinese tech company to to really start to kind of get involved in space was was Baidu uh, via their CEO, Robin Lee, um, who started to lobby for a more, more open space sector all the way back in 2014. And we really have not seen anything from Baidu since then as it relates to space. Um, but they have been more active lately in expanding into things like um, autonomous vehicles, which they, they've consistently had their sort of uh, Apollo sort of self-driving software program being developed. But more recently, they have uh, announced a partnership with was it Xiaomi or was it somebody else to, to develop autonomous cars like the app? But, but anyway, um, digressing. Um, I do think that, that Baidu we may see them get more involved in, in the space sector over the next year or so. So this is, um, again, a little bit speculative, but, um, but certainly uh, this latest involvement of, of TCL, another you know, Chinese tech giant getting involved in space, um, I, I think it, it, it is indicative of, um, I guess, the growing appeal of the industry from a, um, from a, from a, let's say, broader perspective um so yeah i think uh, anything else john from from your side on uh, on tcl all good all right so we can move into the um details on china's commercial launch site and so this is uh getting back to a couple of weeks ago when we discussed the 14th five-year plan and the couple of major space related initiatives within that five-year plan and one of them was the construction of a commercial launch site and at the time uh, we had come across a an article that was posted by i think it was a uh, is it Ryan Leaf on Twitter? Is that uh, no? Ryan Leaf is the football player. Anyway, that, there's uh, that there's a, an excellent uh, Twitter. We we can we can edit his actual name in at some point. Uh, anyway, um, we we have been you know given this information about a, a commercial launch site that was in the long term plan for Ningbo in Zhejiang Province, um, and and there was some speculation that the the commercial launch site that was announced in the five year plan was going to be this one in Ningbo, and we still don't know for sure. However. This last week, Zhejiang province released the provincial 14th five-year plan, and included in this provincial 14th five-year plan was a, a plan to build a commercial spaceport in uh, in Xiangshan, in, in Ningbo. And this is the very same commercial spaceport that was mentioned in Ningbo's previous medium-term development plan. We don't know if it's the same one as the five-year plan, but it is definitely the same one as the Ningbo long-term development plan from last October, possibly last August. And a couple of interesting details the total investment into this commercial launch site is expected to be 20 billion RMB, so about 3 billion US dollars, of which about 12 billion would be invested during this 14th five-year plan, so up between now and the end of 2025. Um, so again, it, it's not 100% clear that the Ningbo commercial spaceport is the commercial spaceport referred to in the national level five-year plan. But the inclusion in the Zhejiang province five-year plan makes this probably rather more unlikely. Uh, sorry, rather more likely. That uh, rather more likely. I would also point out that the scale of the respective launch site is pretty impressive, with about a hundred launches per year eventually, and a total uh, sort of annual economic activity of a hundred billion RMB. Although it's always kind of questionable where those figures come from. The launch site will be sixty-seven square kilometers, of which thirty-five square kilometers will be devoted to launch, and thirty-two square kilometers devoted to an industrial area supporting the launch site. 
Uh, second point on the launch site I would mention is that the location of Ningbo is quite convenient. They have a massive port. It is the world's fourth busiest by container traffic as of 2019 and a pretty long coastline, uh, both of which are beneficial for, for rocket launches in the sense that the port could conceivably make it easier to ship rockets by sea to Ningbo and being on the sea could also allow rockets to be launched over the sea, which is Always nice because it, it leads to less videos of smoldering rocket engines in some village in uh, in Sichuan province. So that's always a good thing. Uh, last point on the commercial launch site, then I'll turn it back over to Yuzhan, is, um, you know, despite having a, a commercial, despite being a commercial launch site, um, we did see several of the usual traditional space suspects getting involved. So um, this included, uh, and so this is all referring to the article that was released earlier this week. Um, the article referred to an agreement in December of last year between Cask and Ningbo to develop a commercial launch site. And it also mentioned a discussion by Kasich Vice Chairman uh, Do Xiaoyu, who uh, at the NPC, the, the National People's Congress earlier this year, uh, mentioned, you know, these huge increases in, in commercial launch requirements that are expected in China. And I think the involvement of Kasich is... Uh, particularly interesting, although not really surprising, in the sense that they have a lot of reason to want the Chinese space sector to become more commercial, in the sense that Kasich is this large government, uh, this SOE, and their traditional sectors, so like uh, missile manufacturing and other such things, they are not so elastic in their demand. And so Kasich would be very happy, I think, to see a bit more opening up in the space sector. So, um, Overall, yeah, a lot of uh, you know, a lot to unpack with uh, with the Ningbo commercial launch site in uh, in the the Elephant Mountain of Xiangshan, which I I suppose is the there's one in Taipei also, isn't there? There's a Xiangshan, if I'm yeah. not wrong, in Taipei. Yeah. Same the same same elephant, same mountain. Yeah, I or you know, the same characters. In yeah, there. very nice place. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's uh, there's a great view of Taipei 101, I think, if I if I recall correctly from my my time there in 2014. But um, so yeah, anything from your side, John, on the the Ningbo commercial launch site? And so, so to your point here on Kasich, I, I think it's it's rather um, to be expected that Kasich and their subsidiary X Space uh, are, are very supportive of these commercial initiatives and um, creation of these uh, commercial launch sites because X Space, for example, they're known as a solid, you know, a manufacturer designer of solid field rockets, the Kuaizhou series. Um, and for solid field rockets, you don't really need that much launch infrastructure. You, oversimplifying it here a bit, but you probably just need a TL type vehicle, you know, uh, you erect your rocket and then off you go. Uh, probably not that simple, but th that's the idea. And, um, but we, we, we know that over the past weeks um, and months and, and, you, and our viewers can watch the, the previous episode of Dong Fang Hour, we know that um, um, X-Space has been lo looking increasingly at liquid field rockets. And if you're planning to launch liquid field rocket, you are going to need those full fledged uh, launch sites that are currently being developed. Um, such as such as Ningbo. And to your point here on Ningbo, I think this is a really good sign of uh, Chinese commercial space developing, commercial launch developing very fast. And we've seen this through the creation of many um, launch startups and, and developing very fast. But apparently we can also feel this um, um, this rapid growth through the these commercial launch site projects. And so there's Ningbo that was described earlier, um, but there's also, um, we know that at Zhou Tren, for example, the oldest launch site that China has, uh, they're planning a commercial um, launch pad that's dedicated specifically to um, uh, Methlox rockets and and that will be used by, very likely by companies such as Landspace and iSpace and Jojo Engine, which all are developing Methlox technology. Um, and we also know that Wenchang, which is China's most recent state-managed launch site in, on the island of Hainan, is also looking a little bit at making their launch site more commercial. And we, we know this because we've seen multiple statements from um, some high-level uh, party officials from Hainan, from Wenchang, say things like, um, so here just quoting Li Dongyu, who's a high-level, I think she's a, he's a vice secretary general for the uh, Chinese Communist Party in Hainan. Um, he mentioned a couple days ago um, about Wenchang. He said, And basically what that means uh, is, is uh, they're planning to make Wenchang into this world-class commercial and commercial operated um, launch site. So that probably means that Wenchang will not just be launching Long March 5s and Long March 7s, but likely could be launching some of these commercial uh, rockets. And what's also interesting about Wenchang is they're not just planning to make uh, Wenchang into a launch site, it already is a launch site, um, but they're planning to also attract a cluster of um, uh, space companies um, in, in the area. So uh, 
so yeah, I think Wenchang is definitely a, a, a commercial launch site to watch in the direction, the commercial direction that it goes in. And now speaking of, unless you want to add something, Blaine, on, on Wenchang. Uh, just one last very brief point on uh, on your your very first point about you know solid versus liquid rockets and and the requirements therefore um it just it it brings me back to you know x space with their i think it's the quadro one a that they were launching from the um from the quadra rector vehicle and i just remember being at um at the CCAF in 2018 and they they had one of those uh, basically set up outside and it was um it it basically looked like they could take that out into the desert and just point it up and uh, that would be fine. It would just go go straight. I mean, you know, again, it's definitely oversimplification, but but yeah, so uh, definitely requires a, a bit more infrastructure to do uh, to do liquid liquid launch, you know, liquid powered rockets. So um, good to see them developing the infrastructure. And uh, in the meantime, I do hope that X space does not um, discontinue the uh, those vehicles because it's pretty cool to watch. But uh, yeah. We can we can now move on to uh, to aerospace propulsion now that I've waxed poetically on X Space's uh, the T T E L vehicle right the, yeah is that the yeah and so speaking yeah. of of commercial speaking of uh, liquid propulsion uh, that brings us to our last piece of news which is a new round of funding for a startup called Aerospace Propulsion or Yuhang Tuiji in Chinese this company which is um, which is basically an engine manufacturer rocket engine manufacturer they raised. 100 million RMB in a pre-A round of funding. That's about 15 million US dollars. Um, with the lead uh, investor, and probably I think the only investor being a company called Weifang Hangdong Aerospace Investment Corporation. And we'll get back to that in a in a in a few minutes. There's there's some newsworthy worthy stuff about this point. But first, some quick background on aerospace propulsion. Um, so as mentioned, they're a rocket engine manufacturer. On paper, it looks like they just might be yet another rocket engine manufacturer in China. And to some extent, that is true when you look at the background of the company. Yes, it is founded by a lead engineer from Cask who left his job to create his own rocket company. And yes, it is building its own Methlox rockets with um, you know levels of thrust and designs that are quite similar to what Landspace and iSpace and the others are doing. Um, but let's look a little bit here at the nuances and the differences. So um, the company, first of all, was founded in August 2018, and that can be considered rather late um, because, um, you know, a lot of these Chinese rocket companies were founded between 2014 and 2017. And so, um, you know, aerospace propulsion sort of have, has this latecomer disadvantage. And we can see this in at, um, you know, based on the level of development of their, their engine compared to their earlier competitors. They're developing the Changlong 1, Changlong 2 Methlox um, engines, which provide respectively 60 and 10 tons of, of thrust. And they're optimized uh, for, you know, first stages and second stages, respectively. Um, they're all under development. And I think there's also a Changlong 3 that's on the roadmap, which would be for an upper stage, but not being developed just yet. And they're also making the Tianswen series rocket engines, which are actually not necessarily for rockets, they're for spacecraft and for in-orbit maneuvers and attitude control. So that's for the background on aerospace propulsion. Now, probably the more interesting part here is the investors of aerospace propulsion. And to a very large extent, aerospace propulsion is still um, owned by its founders. And that's quite interesting. In China, we see this pattern uh, with some other companies. So for aerospace propulsion, it's up to 52% of its ownership based on what I've managed to dig up. And the rest is a mix of three, some public, some private investors, uh, which have basically each of them have five to 20% uh, minority stake. And so um, the, there's one that's an HIT affiliated venture capital fund called uh, Hagong Chanthou. You also have a Beijing based private equity a venture capital firm that's called Pagoda Innovations. And the latest one um, that we mentioned just now is Weifang Hangdong Aerospace. So let's talk a bit more about this company. This this company is interesting because you know Weifang Hangdong Aerospace, they can be traced back to the municipality level fund of the city of Weifang that's called Weifang High Tech Zone, state-owned capital operation management company. Now some background on Weifang to understand what this means. Weifang is a coastal city in the eastern part of Shandong, not too far away from Qingdao City and Yantai City. And worth noting also, um, when this prayer round of funding uh, took place last week, Weifang Handel Aerospace, they said that Weifang City is the city of origin of a large diesel engine and just a transmission uh, systems uh, manufacturer that's state owned but also listed called the Weichai. And this company is very big in Weifang and they serve markets such as 
buses, trucks, uh, heavy duty machinery, marine markets, power generation, all of this. And it seems like the only arrow that's missing their quiver uh, from the point of view of Weifang is, uh, you know, aerospace propulsion. And so um, this could basically mean two things. I mean, this means that possibly um, aerospace propulsion will have to move some of, its co some of its company activities to the city of Weifang. And this is a mechanism that we've seen a lot of municipalities do, you know, investment infrastructure in exchange of you, space tech, moving some activity in our city. Um, this probably wouldn't be too bad for aerospace propulsion because, um, you know, Weifang is in Shandong. Shandong is not too bad from a space perspective. We see some activity growing there. Weifang is a coastal city, so that's probably quite handy for transportation. So doesn't look too bad. I mean, at least compared to Fuzhou Jiangxi, which we'll probably hear Blaine talk about once again uh, when when I give it back to him. Um, and, and just last point I wanted Likely. to mention here is that um, aerospace propulsion seems to be the only investment from Weifang Hangdong Aerospace Investment Company. And this company, Weifang Hangdong Investment, this company was created just four months ago. So it seems that it was created specifically either for aerospace propulsion, either as sort of the investment arm of the city of Weifang to attract aerospace companies. So I think very, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we see this entity invest in other aerospace companies, so just space tech or even just aviation, uh, you know, engine manufacturing um, that would, yeah, wouldn't be surprised if that happened. Yeah, so definitely interesting to see <clears throat> aerospace propulsion getting some some funding from uh, from the the renowned space city of Weifang. Um, so a little bit to to unpack. Um, so first, the name Weifang Hangdong Aerospace Investment. Uh, you know, ha Hangdong is is an interesting combination of characters in the sense that you know Hang like like Hang Tian like aerospace, then Dong uh, is, is you know like Dong Li like um, like propulsion or like you know kind of power this kind of thing. Um, so, so I, I, again, I don't know if that's a, um, a hint as to what was the purpose of this company's creation, but I could not help but, but notice that, um, separately to, to your earlier point about, you know, the, the founding date of, of Hangdong Aerospace Investment being late, uh, 2000, sorry, late 2020, um, and this being their first investment, I, I think concerning is probably too strong of a word, but it could be seen as something of a, um, Maybe sort of a red flag, or just if if, if nothing else, something worth noting um, that this is not a really unique development. Which is to say that you've seen a handful of other you know commercial space companies in China get investment, get funding from VCs or from you know funds that basically got founded about six weeks before the funding round, and this is their first uh, first investment into anything. And and uh, one other example that I would point out, and uh, Jean, you, you called this one, is um, you know back earlier this year, we saw Tianxiang Exploration raising funding uh, from a fund in, in Fuzhou, uh, Jiangxi province called uh, Xinkaiyuan uh, Zizin, uh, that has made one other investment prior to Tianxiang. They were founded in late 2019. Uh, we've seen the same thing occur with, uh, with space companies like Tianbing Aerospace in Tianjin and, and others. And so... Um, I think this is kind of indicative of a of a larger trend in Chinese space, in particular as it compares to space in uh, in the West, and probably more specifically in the U.S. Um, and and you know we we've discussed this a little bit before, but just to to dig a little bit deeper into this, um, the idea that in the U.S. compared to China, the way that government supports space companies is is quite different, and and this is where you know the potential red flag comes in. So in the U.S., you have a situation where, you know, NASA is is very large. They spend lots of money on, on projects and the Department of Defense is very large and they have a lot of space people in the Department of Defense. And both of these in institutions, they they actively support commercial space companies um, and and they they I tend to think in particular in the case of NASA, they really know what they're looking for and they know how to, you know, how to, I presume they know how to really do some rigorous analysis on these companies and say, okay, well, we want to support this company because they have some specific technology that we want, or because they have a great founding team, or because they're working on something that seems really promising, etc. And and I, I again, maybe I give NASA too much credit, maybe I give the DOD too much credit, but my feeling is um, the money in the US for commercial space is primarily coming from a large centralized organization that really kind of knows what they are doing in this area because that like NASA, that is their job to know what they're doing in this area. Yeah. 
And uh, in China, it's quite different. So the support is a lot less centralized in the sense that it is not really coming from the central government as much. And it's much more indirect, which is to say, um, you know, in China, you have the CNSA, which is the sort of equivalent to NASA. But the CNSA is much smaller. They're much more of an administrative body. They don't really award contracts to commercial companies in the same way that NASA does. And likewise, um, you know, CASC, which is the, you know, the large state-owned space company, they certainly don't really like awarding commercial contracts to Chinese space companies. And I could be wrong, and I, I honestly, this is total speculation, but I, I assume that the, the PLA or whomever would be, you know, the, the equivalent of the DOD, um, they also probably would tend to prefer to work more with the state-owned companies than with commercial companies, all else equal. And so this is where you have uh, the, the sort of potential red flag, which is that the 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 regional governments are the ones that are oftentimes helping these space companies. And the regional governments, they don't their their biggest incentive is is sort of short to medium term economic development in the sense that most uh, governors, most mayors, they are kind of graded on their their economic development performance over their tenure. And you know, granted, China, the, the political system is, is shifting away from that uh, to some extent, but that's a rather slow shift away from that. And so without wanting to to sell the governments of, of Fuzhou, Jiangxi, or, or of Weifang, uh, Shandong province short, I would tend to think that um, probably the rocket scientists at NASA or the Milsatcom experts at the U.S. Department of Defense probably have a better understanding of the sector than does a, a VC from uh, from Weifang that was founded 16 weeks ago. Now, again, I, I don't know. I could that VC might be stacked with some excellent people, but in general, it seems like you have a situation now in, in Chinese space where the national government, at a very high level, has said we want to encourage space industry development, and that's good. And how do we do that? We we sort of we we devolve that power to the provinces, and we say you are all now encouraged to develop space industries in your province or city, and you can do that however you see fit. And and again, this is um, this puts a lot of of. of puts a lot of onus on the provinces and on the cities to really know what they're doing when they're giving these companies 100 million RMB. And so I, I you know, I, I guess getting to the point here, I mean, does this mean that the Chinese commercial space sector is doomed to fail? Definitely not. Um, but does it mean that we're probably going to see a pretty inefficient style of development and a style that is sort of less market driven and potentially even less, uh, let's say, tech driven in the sense that, again, NASA is going to these commercial companies and saying, we need this, or, you know, you, you, this is, and, and if this is coming from NASA. This is coming from people who know, uh, versus, you know, in, in Weifang, you have, um, a provincial government that's saying, you know, we, we would like to, to see some space companies come to Weifang and that would be very good for us. And so all, all of that. Um, and so I, I think to that extent, you're, you're likely to see this, uh, the development of the industry be a little bit messy or a little bit inefficient. And um, I guess one other example that I would point to that that might uh, support this idea is the fact that in China now we have something like seven commercial launch clusters. We have Beijing, which is a lot of launch companies. We have Tianjin with Tianbing Aerospace and a couple of others. We have Huzhou with Land Space and with uh, the newly announced Rocket Group, uh, Huo Tianpai. We have Wuhan with X Space. We have Jianyang with Galactic Energy and, and you know and others in, in Sichuan and Chengdu. Uh, we have Ningbo. We have Guangzhou, and then we have of course Xi'an, which is the home of Chinese aerospace power. And so. Um, a lot of I guess there's even Nantong, right? With Deep Blue Aerospace. There's Nantong as well with Deep Blue Aerospace. Yes, yeah. How could I forget Nantong? Yes. So so yeah, I mean really just, just uh so so I mean, you know, getting back to my point, like is it likely that there will be one or two or you know, however many really excellent world class launch companies emerging from this this you know, this ether of of Chinese launch clusters? Probably yes. Um, but is are there also probably going to be a bunch of underutilized rocket industrial bases in places that don't really need rockets? And are there likely to be a lot of of you know commercial launch companies that have either gone bankrupt or otherwise been acquired? Or you know, so I think probably yes. Also, like I, I don't think it's likely that in ten years we're going to have you know twenty five or thirty commercial launch companies in China. And you know, eight or ten big launch sites, and if we do, then then hey, that's that's awesome, and I I would be very happy to be you know flying over China at one point in an airplane and just seeing all these rockets coming up from different launch <laughs> sites as I'm flying over, saying wow, there's there's a there's a deep aerospace rocket, and there's you know all, all these things, but um, 
digressing, I, I, I don't necessarily know to what extent, um, you know, the, the, the Weifang Hangdong uh, Aerospace Investment Group founded in, uh, in January of 2021 or, you know, December of 2020, I, I don't know to what extent, um, they are, you know, e extremely well positioned to understand whether aerospace propulsion is going to succeed. And again, I, I do not want to sell them short. And if there's anyone from from uh, Weifeng Hangdong who would like to to come and, and discuss their their qualifications with us, that would be awesome. Be very happy to hear from them. And so we'll see. Uh, on that happy note, anything else from your side, John? A couple of other news updates, or shall we uh, we wrap it up and save it for next time? Yeah, I think I'm all good. We're at 35 minutes now. <laughs> good stuff. Well, then, that being the case, thank you very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 5th to 11th of April. Again, be on the lookout for our long form, long form episode with the SWF and Kalis Foundation to be released tomorrow. And uh, I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by Jean Deville. See you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.